Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. I do appreciate you being with me here on Friday morning on Now TV. I hope that you are uh, sharing this message with others. Uh, look, even if it's nothing more than to say, do you know what that weird dude on Now TV is saying? Man, you got to tune in. You got to watch this guy. You just got to listen to him. Uh, you may be one of those people, and there have been countless of them, uh, who, who may say, well, I'm going to watch this guy just to prove him wrong. <laughs> I've got some really, really good friends right now who began listening to me, studying along with what I was saying and teaching, taking extensive notes, going home, reading the scriptures. And they've told me, the only reason I listened to you in the first place, the only reason I started coming to a men's Bible study was because of what some of the other guys were saying, and I couldn't believe what they were saying. So I decided to come, listen for myself. I was going to take my notes. I was going to go home. I was going to study for myself, and I was going to prove you wrong. And now they are some of the most zealous people in proclaiming the wonderful news of the faithfulness of God. I mean, I, I, they are literally on fire and have been for years and for years now. So, like I said, look, if your only reason for watching this program if your only reason for watching William Bell on Saturday afternoons is to try to, quote, prove us wrong, that's fine. Listen, if, if you have objections to, to some of the things that I'm saying, I always welcome good, solid questions. I am absolutely not afraid to be challenged on what I believe. Now, let's do it nicely, okay? Uh, when people attack me on YouTube or Facebook, and by the way, I produce videos on YouTube about five days a week. I, you know, I currently have about five, almost 5,000 subscribers. Now, in the big scheme of things, I, I don't have 150 or 200,000 or a million subscribers. Sure wish I did, but it's growing and has been growing, continues to grow. So, you know, check out those videos. They're free of charge. And if you have objections, then go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. On the Contact Us tab, just send me uh, an email and say, listen, I was watching your program, and uh, man, I, I just can't agree with this or that or the other, and state your case. And as time permits, as time permits, because believe you me, I am inundated with emails every single day. But as time permits, I will give what I believe to be God's answer to your objection. I will try to point you in the direction of some good, solid, uh, biblically-based material that you can read at your own leisure. You're going to find literally thousands of articles on my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. And again, they're free of charge. So you can go there. You can do a search for whatever subject it is that, that you're concerned about, that you have questions about, and read the articles. And if they do not answer your question, then again, feel free to contact me. In the meantime, thank you again for joining me here on Friday morning on Now TV. The, this station, this network is ex continuing to expand and to grow. Uh, listen, I would, be, I would be thrilled to be able to expand into some of the additional areas that they are now opening up. Unfortunately, that takes more money, and I don't have that extra money right now. Due to the corona situation, my monthly support from those who have supported me so very faithfully down through the years, uh, unfortunately, it's affected that. And 
obviously, if you'd like to support this program, you can go again to my website. If you want to send me an email, say, how do I support your ministry? How do I support the expansion of your outreach on Now TV? And I'll be glad to provide that information. And listen, if you've been watching me for several months, then you know very good and well, I don't get on here. Like so many other television evangelists, I don't get on air and I do not constantly appeal for money. That, that's not in my makeup, all right? Uh, the, the folks who support me financially on a monthly basis or through one-time gifts ever so often, they just feel very, very strongly about sharing this message as I do. And so, listen, if you feel the same way, if you would like to support this ministry, then again, go to my website, donkpreston.com or bibleprophecy.com and send me an email to ask how you can support our ministry. It's, you know, tax exempt if you're living in the U.S. Of course, if you're living out of the U.S., it doesn't matter, does it? But anyway, uh, any help at all that you could, could, could give us would be greatly appreciated. And, and again, you're not, gonna, you're not going to see me here every Friday morning appealing for money. All right? I'm just not going to do that. But. If you feel the need, <clears throat> and if you have the desire to support this ministry, we would more than welcome it. Well, we are continuing our study of the challenge of Christ. What is that challenge of Christ? Well, I've got to tell you, uh, on Facebook, over the last couple of weeks, I have been confronted by those, number one, who claim to be Christians, number two, by those who do not call themselves Christians. And what, what is so paradoxical, what is so amazing is that both of these groups of individuals, those who claim to be Christians, those who make no pretense of being Christians, they have both made the identical argument. Jesus said he was coming back in the first century. He did not do it, therefore he failed. When I have confronted the Christians with their self-contradiction, with their massive problem. I mean, after all, Deuteronomy 18, 18 and following, the Lord said, if a man claims to be a prophet and he says, speaks of anything that is to come to pass, and if it does not come to pass, then you know I did not send him. He is not a prophet. And yet here are Christians saying, well, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you read the words of Jesus and if you read the words of the New Testament writers, it certainly appears that they were saying Jesus was coming back in the first century. Of course, we know he didn't do it. Folks, that's calling Jesus a liar. That's calling his apostles false prophets. And that means the Bible is not inspired exactly and precisely like the Jews claim Exactly and precisely like the Muslims claim. Exactly and precisely like the atheists claim. Now, as I've shared with you folks, this is the challenge of Christ. Jesus said, the Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angels and shall reward every man according as his works. There are some, verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. That was 2,000 years ago. And look, folks, we don't have any 2,000-year-old people running around in this world. Let's face it. I mean, it's, it's almost silly for me to have to say something like that. But it's necessary. So if we don't have any 2,000-year-old people Walking around in our world today, oh, by the way, in spite of what our Mormon friends say, no, there are not 2,000-year-old people running around in this world today. But since we don't, then that means that Jesus either lied or he failed. That's the challenge of Christ. And remember, Jesus himself said, if I do not do the works which the Father has given me, do not believe me. 
Jesus said one of the works <clears throat> the Father had given him was to come with the angels on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory in judgment in the first century. There's our challenge. Did he keep his word or did he lie or did he fail? Now, we've been going through 2 Peter chapter 3. And the reason we're doing that is because so many people want to say, well, look, uh, 2 Peter 3 just clearly, clearly teaches that the world's going to come to an end. Heaven and earth will pass away. Don't forget, I've written a book, The Elements Shall Melt with Fervent Heat. It is the only full preterist commentary on 2 Peter chapter 3 that I'm aware of. You can go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, go to the store, order that book. Now, this offers for U.S. orders only, but order that book and say, Don, I saw your offer on Now TV, and I'll refund your shipping. Once again, this is for U.S. orders only. Now, if you're out of the U.S. and you want to purchase a PDF of the book at 50% reduction, then contact me and say, well, I live here or I live there. I don't live in the U.S. Shipping would be too much to me, whether it's Australia or India or pa Pakistan or Ethiopia or wherever it is, <clears throat> okay? And I can help you with that. So I have shared with you how Peter has said, 2 Peter chapter 3, 1 and 2, this second epistle I've written unto you, Holy brethren, in both of which to stir up your holy minds by way of remembrance, that you might be mindful of that which is spoken by the holy prophets beforehand, and of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have, <clears throat> and you'll have to apologize. I'll have to apologize to you for rubbing my eyes, as I've shared with you last week. I think it was uh, allergies are just raging. And my eyes itch, uh, you know, I may sneeze, be, be fair warned, all right, but I, I, my eyes just, they're just driving me crazy. And it just seems like nothing that I take completely nullifies that. So I apologize, but it's just, it's what I'm living with. So here is Peter saying, knowing this, and remember, remember he's reminding us that the Old Testament prophets foretold these things. Knowing this first, that there shall be in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, where's the promise of his coming? Now, I've shared with you that many people try to say that preterists are those scoffers because they're saying, oh, the Lord's not coming back. No, scoffers denied the coming of the Lord as a reality Actually, they were just basically saying, oh, tell, okay, a lot of time has passed. It was supposed to be in this generation. We're living near, near the end of this generation, so where is it? They actually were not denying the reality of it. They were denying or they were pointing out that a lot of time had passed in that generation and it hadn't happened yet, so they were saying, where is it? <clears throat> but you see, that affirms the reality of the language of eminence because they were understanding that the prediction was that it was coming soon. It was coming in that generation. They were living in that very generation. They were just simply saying, okay, where is it? <clears throat> okay. So, Peter says the scoffers would come in the last days in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. By the way, that shows us that the last days were not the last days of the Christian age, unless you can prove that the Old Testament prophets foretold the last days of the Christian age. Oh, by the way, we have seen the Christian age has no end. No end. Therefore, guess what? We're not in the last days. All right? I shared with you over the last couple of videos the prophecy from the Old Testament that Peter was almost undoubtedly drawing from in his citation <clears throat> of the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets who were going to deny 
the coming of the Lord. They were scoffers. Now, Isaiah chapter 28 is that passage. I started with verse 14, and it's very difficult to jump into this text uh, because it's, it, the, the chapter is united. And by the way, I mean, I want to tell you, if you read the entire text, you know that the Lord here in uh, Yahweh in Isaiah 28 is foretelling the yet future to him the last day's judgment of old covenant Israel at the day, verse 5 and following, when the Lord would be glorified. Well, when was the Lord going to come and be glorified? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 tells us it was to be in the lifetime of the Thessalonians who were being persecuted for their faith, but were promised relief from that vindication, quote, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in flaming fire to take vengeance on those that do not know God and that do not obey the gospel in that day when he comes to be glorified in his saints. You see? In the lifetime of the Thessalonians. So that's the context of Isaiah chapter 28. And the Lord said, at that last days, he said, uh, you are the ones who say we made a covenant with death. And with Sheol, we are in agreement when the over, overflowing scourge passes through will not come to us. In other words, they were saying, hey, you know, uh, because we belong to the Lord, uh, nothing, nothing's going to happen to us. Now, I shared with you that is echoed in Jeremiah chapter 7, written much later, in which the Lord says, do you come to this temple, which is called by my name, and you say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. We are, because of these things, because of the temple, we are free to lie and to steal, to commit adultery, to commit, a fornic to commit fornication, and to abuse the widow, and to abuse the orphans. And the Lord said, no, because you are called my people, because this place is called my house, does not give you the right to do that, and it does not absolve you of guilt or of coming judgment. And th thus he told them, you need to purge yourselves of this wickedness. If you will keep my word, if you will honor the fathers, the fatherless and the widow, if you will not commit all of these abominations, then, yeah, I will cause you to dwell in this place and in this land. But if you do not obey my words, I will remove you from my presence. So here is Isaiah 28. Predicting a time in the last days. See, Jeremiah was predicting the Babylonian invasion that was going to happen in his days, which was a foreshadowing of what would happen in the last days. In which the Lord says, look, you, you, can, you can make all the claims that you want to and say, we are the Lord's. We're free from judgment. The Lord will not judge us. And the Lord says, it will not work. I will come and I will judge you. That was his pledge and promise and prophecy. So, then we come to verse 16 and following. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a glorious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also, I will make justice the measuring line, righteousness the plummet, the hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. See, that's back to the previous verses where the Lord says, you, uh, you're lying to yourself. If you think that you can escape judgment, you're wrong. I'm going to sweep those lies away. And the waters will overflow the hiding place. See, here's another flood, another flood of judgment, a flood of judgment at the day of the Lord. A judgment by flood, but not water. It's called a flood, but it's not water. Your covenant with death will be annulled. See, he's referring back to what he had just said there in verse 15. And your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overflowing scourge passes through, then you 
will be trampled down by it. As often as it goes out, it will take you. For morning by morning, it will pass over. And, and by day and by night, it will be terror just to understand the report. And folks, this is bad news. Oh, but wait. The silver lining is that at the time of this judgment, the Lord says, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. In other words, you're not going to be, you're not going to be destroyed in this overwhelming flood of destruction that is coming. You will be saved. Now, <clears throat> I want to develop this a little bit, and I want you to see that in the New Testament, in the New Testament, this promise of the stone and the foundation stone and the corollary to it of the rejected corner stone is one of the most powerful motifs that we are given. In Psalms 118, 21 and following, the Lord said, <clears throat> the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief corner stone. Well, see, that was in Psalms. And here is Isaiah reiterating that promise. Now, I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 8 very, very quickly with you. Hope you have your Bibles open. Do you? Hope you have your notebook handy with your pencil pencil paper. Do you? I want to go back to, uh, to Isaiah chapter 8 because you see, th this precious cornerstone is the cornerstone of the Messianic temple in the kingdom of God. And in Isaiah chapter 2, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains and shall be exalted uh, above the hills. And many people will come and say, let come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord's house for he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his pathways. So here you see is Isaiah predicting the coming of the Messianic temple in the last days. Okay, Isaiah chapter 8, the Lord said of the coming of the Messiah, he will be a sanctuary but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. As a trap and a snare unto the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now look, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus cites this verse. To apply it to himself. Oh, but that's not all. <clears throat> Pardon me. In Matthew chapter 21. Oh, you know, in Luke, as Jesus is taken into the temple, what happened? Simeon takes the child and lifts him up and says, Lord, uh, let me now die in peace because you told me that I would not die <clears throat> until I had seen the salvation of the Lord. And now here he is. And this child is set for the rise and the fall of many in Israel. Citing Isaiah chapter 8. So here we have the New Testament writers recording that with the birth of Jesus, the time had come for the rejected stone to be set in place. Well, of course, in Luke chapter 2, Jesus, the stone, <clears throat> hasn't even begun his ministry. Jesus, the stone of the Messianic temple, has not even been rejected. Now, 
what, what that means is, is that when Simeon said, I have seen the salvation of the Lord, I have seen the salvation of your people, and this child is set for the rise and the fall of many in Israel, that he's speaking proleptically. Now, <clears throat> proleptic, kind of a big word, isn't it? Well, prolepsis, or proleptic, means that something is so sure to happen, pardon me, that it is stated as being already true. Now remember, Jesus is, a, is a, a, an infant in Luke chapter 2. He's not even 12 years old. He's just a baby. And so he hasn't gone through his teenage years, has not entered into his ministry, as Luke chapter 3 says, when he began to be about 30 years old. He began to teach. No. And he had not obviously been rejected yet. Do you see the power of that? So even though Isaiah chapter 8 was foretelling it, even though Isaiah 28 was foretelling it, and even though Simeon said, I've seen it, no, all he was saying was the time had arrived. The time for what? The last days. Because after all, Jesus was the foundation stone for the Messianic temple, which would be constructed in the last days. You see the power of that? Now, Isaiah chapter 28 says, this is going to be, I'm going to lay in Zion. Now, question is, is this literal, physical Zion slash Jerusalem? Well, our dispensational friends tell us it most assuredly is. Oh, but wait. In Hebrews chapter 12, 21 and following, the writer contrasts the Old Covenant Jerusalem with the New Covenant Jerusalem and says, you've not come here, but you have come to Mount Zion. Well, folks, he wasn't writing to people who had come to literal Jerusalem. And so we'll have to discuss that next week. I'll see you then.